Sure. Our special guest today is Republican presidential candidate Rick Santorum. Rick spent over 17 years in Washington as a U.S. representative and senator with a record of many accomplishments. He's a committed Christian who will be sharing his views on the issues of this election season. We'll also be hearing from former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee, who is not running for president later on in this program. We have yes. Senator Rick Santorum with us. And what a privilege to have him. He's just mm -hmm. a delightful person. I want you to know that. And we're going to just say welcome. Well, thank you, Bob. It's great to be here. Thank you for those kind comments. I appreciate it, Jane. Thank you. Nice to have you with thank us. Thank you very much. Uh, we're just going to get right into it. Okay. And to me, I think I'd have to say that abortion is the number one issue. And how do you feel about it? Well, I agree with you that uh, if you go back and, and look at the founding of our country, uh, the uh, founding of our country was uh, uh, at the Declaration of Independence, which is, I believe, while the Constitution is given a lot of airtime these days, that the real, um, uh, real soul of America is in the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. Because it's the Declaration that said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by our Creator right. with unalienable rights. Mm -hmm. That to me is the heart and soul of America. It is the reason for America. And of course our founders said that the first right that God gives us is the right to life. And it is foundational. It goes on and talks about liberty and pursuing happiness, but of course you can't be free unless you're alive and you certainly can't pursue happiness. And so uh, the foundational right to life is something that is the first responsibility of this society. That's what, that's what, that's what our founders said. And we had a constitution that was constructed to protect those rights. If you really think about what the constitution is there to do. It says rights come to us from God. We created this Operator's Manual for America, which is the Constitution, right. the how of America. And by the way, to protect I have those one. rights. I have one. And, oh, you have it. There with you me. go. <laughs> All right. That's I'll, the same one I have. There you go. And, you know, the, the bottom line is this is a very important document. Yes. But the, the, that document would be, uh, well, let's just put it this way that the French at the same time, roughly the same time America was going through its revolution, went through a revolution of their own. And if you look at the Constitution of France, it was not that dissimilar from the Constitution of America. But what happened that made the Constitution of France a document that turned into bloodshed and tyranny? Well, they didn't have the founding document that we had. Mm -hmm. They based their Constitution on the same rights but they didn't say where those rights came from. There was no God. It was a secular revolution. Mm. We based our constitution on a God, a creator, the Judeo-Christian God, who said, not only do I give you rights, but I also give you laws by which you have to live those rights, exercise those rights. I always say when you, you look at the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, life foundational, you have to be alive before you can exercise freedom, but freedom is essential to, to actually pursue what? 
happiness. But what was happiness? What did our founders think happiness was? It was very, you go back and read dictionary definitions of happiness at the time of our founders, you know what they say? To do the morally good thing. Mm -hmm. Our founders understood that our, that God gave us the right to life, liberty, to pursue His will. And that if we pursued His will, that's when you're happy. That's what true happiness is. Right. Doing what you yeah. ought to do, what you are called to do. And we will build a good and just society. And uh, John Adams said about this Constitution that it was made for a moral and religious people. It was wholly inadequate to the governance of any other. Mm. And he said that because a constitution which gives that amount of freedom and rights to people without the foundation of a moral law that we all were governed by leads to revolutionary France, the guillotine and tyranny. You know, we, have, we do a little segment in all of our programs that is, um, what is the name? Uh, what's, we the people. <laughs> That's the name. We right? the people. And uh, it's exactly what you said. We go back to all those founding so documents. Yes, it is. And important. tell the people. They don't think it's that, at least I don't think you think it's that important. But to me, it's fundamentally important to us. Absolutely. If Ronald Reagan said at the, his farewell address, if you read his farewell address when he left office, the last couple of paragraphs, he talked about his concern for the future of America because Americans didn't, weren't learning who we were, weren't learning what our foundational principles were. And as you know, I'm sure that they have these tests now, these national tests, and of all the subject matters that uh, they test high school seniors, the worst area of our chil uh, children do in school is history. history. Yeah, they have no idea amazing. what America is all about. Right. And when you have a society that doesn't understand who you are, what we're all about, then you have a society that can be influenced by those who try to create a new America mm -hmm. because we don't understand what made America great. Well, that's during my campaign for president. Uh, I talk about this. This is not a conversation we're having just because we're here. I talk about this, these very issues in almost every speech I give because I think it's if we're going to ask America to step up and confront the, the economic problems that we have, this, the moral and social problems that we have, the, the uh, national security problems we have, we've got to remind people how we got here and who we are yes. and what kind of nation we are and what our duty is to the next generation. Mm. Well, you proved in your legislation, you know, you, you uh, passed the Inf Born Alive Infant, Infant Protection, Protection Act. Act. Yeah. That was one of, the, one of the bills I introduced and, you know, we, we talk about uh, people say, well, why would you be better running against Barack Obama than all the other Republican candidates for president? Uh, and one of the issues I point to is that Born Alive Infant Protection Act. It was a bill that I wrote uh, and authored the, in the United States Senate when I was there that said if, if a child was born alive as a result of an, of an abortion or any, any, in any situation, but I included abortion specifically, then that child had the right to appropriate medical treatment. Because what we had seen is instances we I had heard about and, and writ been written about and reported on were children who uh, were delivered alive as a result of a botched abortion were either killed or just literally thrown in a trash can and left to die. Right. Uh, and uh, we said, well, no, there should be a federal law that says that that is an illegal practice. Well, we passed it and passed unanimously in the Senate which is not Thanks an easy God. thing to do. Wow. Unanimously right. in the House and the Senate passed and signed by President Bush. But other states thought, well, this is something we want on our state laws, too. We just don't want to have a federal enforcement, we want state enforcement. And so states all around the country started passing that very same law. It came to the state of Illinois. And to my knowledge, there was only one person, and not only in the state of Illinois, but in this country, who went to the floor of their legislature and voiced opposition to this bill. He got up and said that if we approve this bill, that means that any child born before term, before 40 weeks gestation, would be entitled to the right to life. And that would undermine Roe versus Wade oh and the right to abortion. And therefore, I vote against it. And you know who that person was? Barack Obama. 
Wow. The only person in the country that I'm aware of who spoke against this bill and made the argument that any child born before 40 weeks of age, whether under abortion or in any circumstances, according to his logic, can be killed by the mother and the, and the doctor if the mother and the doctor mm. so choose. Mm. That is a radical point of view. Yes, it is, especially when you think of all the doctors and all the mothers and how far they're away from God. Yeah. yeah. And that's really the reason for abortion. They, they don't know God. They're not concerned with godly principles. And that's the result of that. Well, they don't see his creation. Right. I mean, they're co-creators with God of a, of a, of a human soul. Mm -hmm. And that's what the mother and father do. They right. cooperate with God in the creation of an of a, of a eternal being. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it that way, well, how could you not do anything oh, but celebrate <laughs> that incredible gift that you've been given? And, and do everything you could to nurture that human being and that soul. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, if you don't look at it that way, if you look at it as an inconvenience, you look at it as a burden. I'll never forget President Obama saying in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, when he was asked a question, what would you do if your daughter became pregnant? And he said, I would never want her to punish her with a, with a child, force her to be punished with a child. Mm -hmm. And that's, if that's the way you look at children, that's the way you look at this eternal soul, this gift from God. Yeah. Then um, you're right. You you can you can do horrible things yeah. if you don't see that spark, that light. Right. Well, you know, Christians are so concerned about pro-life issues. They're also concerned about Israel and our stance yeah. with Israel, because we know what the Scripture says. Yeah. And it says, you know, He said to God said to Abraham. I will bless those that bless yes. you, and I will curse those that curse you. Yeah. How do you feel about Israel? Well, that's a, you know, uh, you talked about my pro-life record, and I was involved in the Born Alive Infant Protection Act, and the Partial Birth Abortion Act was also my bill, and the Unborn Victims of Violence Act. There was nobody that, uh, every major piece of pro-life legislation that came through, I was an author of. But I was also very active on national security, and in particular with the state of Israel. Uh, there are two major pieces of legislation that passed uh, in the first uh, during the Bush administration dealing with Israel. One had to do with the government of Syria, the other had to do with Iran. Both, I would argue, major threats to the state of Israel. Right. One called the Syrian Accountability Act, which put sanctions on Syria at the time. You may remember there was a war in between Lebanon and, 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 the, and Israel because of the influence of Hezbollah in Syria in Lebanon. I, I authored a bill that, that put sanctions on Syria if they did not withdraw their forces from Lebanon and withdraw their support, uh, active support for Hezbollah in Lebanon, which was threatening northern Israel. Uh, at the time I introduced it, uh, President Bush opposed it. Said, well, it's none of your business, so let me handle these things, and we don't need the Congress meddling. And over the course of about a year and a half, I, I was the uh, the biblical story of keeping knocking on the door at night, saying, you know, you know, I I, I, I need this, I need this. And finally, the president came along and, and agreed to to sign it, and we passed it. And and within a few months, Syria got out of Lebanon. Mm. Uh, so it it was a and you know, while that situation there obviously is still not great. It, the, that immediate threat was removed. Secondly, I, I worked on a bill called the Iran Freedom Support Act. Way back in 2004, when our CIA was saying that Iran doesn't have a nuclear program and isn't a threat, I said Iran is developing a nuclear weapon, will develop a nuclear weapon, and will use it either to destroy the state of Israel or use it as a protection so they can go out and F and, and encourage others and train others and fund others to do the same, to destroy the state of Israel, because Iran has been very clear. Ahmadinejad mm -hmm. says, I want to wipe Israel off the face of the map. Yes, he mm -hmm. did. And so I believe, when people say things like that, I tend to believe yes, them, yes. okay? And so uh, I authored a bill that, uh, that put sanctions on, their, uh, on, on, on Iran for their nuclear program, and secondly, funded with a hundred billion dollars, a hundred million dollars a year, the pro-democracy movement in Iran. And um, again, President Bush opposed me. Joe Biden blocked the bill on the floor of the Senate for a, for a week. Mm. And we couldn't get it passed. And uh, it turned out to be, when I finally uh, was able to push it uh, out to the floor, it was, it was the spring of 2006. But by the, uh, 
fall of 2006, both Biden and the president come around, to my opinion. And we ended up passing that bill and, and uh, it put sanctions on Iran, which are still in force today, and which have helped slow the nuclear development process in Iran. And secondly, we passed money for to help the uh, anti-regime, anti-Ahmadinejad and Mullah regime in Iran. And the problem is, uh, President Obama, when he came into office, he cut all the money. Mm. Said, we're not going to fund, we're not going to disrupt this government. And in fact, as you know, when the revolution happened, the Green Revolution happened two years ago in Iran, he took the side of Ahmadinejad and the mullahs against the, 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 uh, uh, the pro-democracy folks in the streets of Iran. And, and now that regime is even more entrenched and they are moving forward to develop a nuclear weapon and the president is doing also absolutely nothing to stop them. Wow. Well, we've got so many questions. Well, I'm sorry. I'll, take, I'll give shorter <laughs> answers. No, that's fine. The economy? <laughs> yeah, well, that's one we were going to ask. The economy. <laughs> well, Bob. What uh, would you do? How do you turn this around? I'd say there's uh, three things. The first three things I would do uh, is, as President of the United States is number one, repeal Obamacare. One of the big things that is hurting our uh, business community is the uncertainty yes. of this new huge cost and regula regulation on the business community. And, and so number one, I would repeal Obamacare, and we can do that. Uh, there's no question that uh, uh, I've been in the United States Senate for 12 years and the House for four. I know what can and can't be done. We could pass a repeal of Obamacare. Secondly, uh, I would push and would go around the country and I would uh, campaign for a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. Uh, that's something that would stabilize our currency, stabilize markets, show the, Amer show the American public and the world that the United States is committed to number one, limited government, and number two, balancing yeah. our budget. And that will provide great long-term stability for our country if we commit ourselves to that pass. Third, we need to do something to jumpstart the economy. One area of the economy I think has been lagging the most and could have the most dramatic impact on getting it, the, uh, the unemployment rate down and down dramatically is to revitalize our manufacturing base. When I was a kid growing up in a little steel town in western Pennsylvania, we had 21% uh, of the workforce in this country was involved in manufacturing. It's now nine. If you want to know where the middle of America went, where all those jobs that supported families and, and were, the, were the mainstay of the community, they went to China, they went to Malaysia, they went over yeah. India. We need to get those jobs back and we can get them back. Yes. We can get them back if we can do three things. Number one, we need to take taxes. We charge 35% taxes on manufacturers in this country who uh, want to make things and produce things here and export them overseas. I want to take that 35% rate and cut it to zero. That if you manufacture in this country, we're not going to charge you as a corporation. Why? Because we know that if we do that, jobs will come back and jobs we otherwise wouldn't have, yeah. we're now going to have and we're going to be paying taxes and they're going to, if, if it was out in actually more revenue coming to the federal government. And as you all know, that when you manufacture and you make things, well, you have transportation to take them there, you have all sorts of other, what's called a multiplier effect that makes the economy grow even faster. So cutting the corporate tax rate to zero, second thing tax-wise, is all of these companies that make things overseas, when they make them overseas and they make profits, they have to leave the profits over there. Why? Because, well, they pay taxes in China on the profits. But if they want to bring them back here, then they have to pay a 35% tax on those profits again. And so they simply don't, they simply leave them there and reinvest that money in China. And so in conjunction with cutting the corporate tax to zero, we'd say anybody that wants to bring that money back to invest it in plant and equipment here in America, we're going to charge them a 5% tax, not a 35% tax. So you're going to provide not only a tax uh, environment to, to build things here, but you're going to give them the, now the resources they already have to build it. So you're going to get instant explosion of manufacturing. So that to me is the number one thing we can do. Energy is the other thing. We have to do something about energy prices. It also creates jobs. We need to drill for more oil, more gas. We have to mine coal to use fossil fuels to create jobs and to keep electric prices and gas prices down to help our manufacturers compete. Why? It is so simple, really. Why don't other people agree with that? Um, 
I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, all I can say is that I think we have a plan that really will jumpstart uh, America and oh, and so fuel too. the middle class, like, you know, the middle income of America. Well, you know, there are a lot of people out there in America, and I'm one of them, that wonders why we have not been drilling. Uh, well, we it's, have the oil is out there, we just don't drill. Uh, you know, I. I I hate to be cynical, but I, I think that the people who are involved in the environmental movement who have said that we shouldn't be drilling in offshore, we shouldn't be drilling in the Gulf, we shouldn't be drilling in, uh, in Alaska uh, or in North Dakota, uh, want to do so because, not because of the environment. I mean, we, we're in Pennsylvania, we're, we're drilling oil and gas wells right now, three to 4,000 a year. We found the largest gas reserve in the history of the country underneath mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, natural gas reserve, really? and one of the largest oil deposits. And just in the last three years, and if you look at wow. natural gas prices, you'll see that about, that uh, within the last 10 years, they've gone from about $12 to four. Why? Because of this gas deposit underneath Pennsylvania. And we're drilling in people's backyards for oil and gas, and yet when we want to drill in the tundra in Alaska that's frozen over nobody it's a flat frozen barren wasteland when we want to drill up there oh no we can't well there's a polar bear there no well there's not even <laughs> polar there's a caribou occasionally that go by and they tend to like having these facilities there because it keeps the wolves away because all the noise so they can calve near these sites and that, that's that's actually been true, proven to be true that the caribou herds actually do better because of the noise that keeps the predators away. So uh, it's, it, it makes no sense environmentally. What is it about? It's about government control. It's about wanting, seeing man as the problem, not the object. Right. So it's what do you think back. about big government? I actually wrote a book back in 2005 uh, in response to a book written by, at the time, the vice pre the, the uh, not the vice president, the first lady of, of America by the name of Hillary Clinton. She wrote a book you may recall called It Takes a Village. Well, I wrote a responsive book called It Takes a Family. And I talk in that book about the great threats to the family and to, to faith in America is big government, big anything, uh, that want to control the, uh, you know, the actions of the family and, and, and of our society. And uh, I've really dedicated a career uh, to try to reduce the power and scale of government in Washington, D.C. Get those back to the states. I'll give one example. Welfare reform. You may remember that was one of the signature accomplishments of the Republican Congress. I was the author of that bill that cut the federal entitlement to welfare, sent it back to the states, required work, put time limits on welfare. And even today, the welfare rolls are still roughly half of what they were back in 1996. In 1996, we were in the middle of a, a great expansion in 1996. You know, unemployment rate was relatively low, economy was humming along, yet un the, the welfare rolls were as high as they ever were. Why? Because people became dependent. We're in the same place right now with, this, with respect to food stamps. Food stamps have just, we, the more people have food stamps in America today, and it's, it's long term. People just continually depend on it. And it's not a good idea. It's not good for people to be on government benefits for a long period of time. We have to have work requirements, time limits, and we can't have a federal entitlement. It's too expensive, and states should be managing these programs, not Washington, D.C. Now, I heard, and I don't know if it's true, but there are more food stamps today. Yeah than at any time Ever. in our history. Yeah. Same thing, and, and the same, that is true for food stamps today as it was for welfare back in 1996 when we passed the bill. But we changed the welfare system. We never did the food stamp system. We changed the welfare system. And we cut welfare, uh, ben, uh, welfare recipients in half. The welfare rolls were cut in half. And very importantly, unemployment among those who were on welfare went down substantially. In other words, employment went up and poverty went down. In fact, we, within five years of the welfare reform bill passing, the rate of poverty among black children in America reached the lowest level ever recorded. Wow. And still poverty levels, as well as welfare rolls, are below, even now in the third year of a recession, below where they were in 1996. Mm. Uh, wow. Um, what else do we have? Well, I just wanted to talk to you about <laughs> being a, a pro-military because you were on the Armed Forces Committee. Yes, ma'am. And you know, probably more than a lot know, 
just because you were on that committee. Yeah, one so of could you talk about uh, sure. a strong a military strong is really important. Uh, I think so too. You know, I've I've talked about we have to get our our federal budget deficit under control. I said, but the one area I will not cut is the defense uh, budget. And the reason I say that is not because there isn't waste in the defense budget. There certainly is. There's certainly improvements that can be made, but the principal responsibility of the federal government, the indispensable role the federal government plays in all of the governments that we have in our, in our country is national security. And while you know, having, uh, providing health care uh, for some people is important for the federal government to do, states can do that. If the federal government says we don't have enough money to do it, then states can pick up the ball and do it. But states can't defend the, the country. They can't defend the border. They can't uh, fight wars. And that's something the federal government must do. And so when we saw this budget deal that just happened, where uh, we, uh, the, President Obama uh, required that uh, for this com committee, this super committee that was put together, required that if the committee didn't come up with a solution that half the budget cuts would come out of defense mm. was just a devastating thing for our people to agree with. They should not have agreed to that. The president has been singular in his note. We have to increase taxes and cut defense. That's all he's wanted to do. Both are bad ideas. One hurts the economy and one hurts our ability to defend ourselves. And so uh, I would say that you know what we need to do is more than anything else, I think we need to increase the number of men and women in our uni in, in uniform. We have. You talked, I know here in Florida, you have a very, very active military community here, but they're stretched. They're on their third, fourth, fifth deployments. I mean, this is, this is just not fair to the, to the men and women in uniform. So if anything, we need to expand our defense if we're going to keep these commitments that we have. And we need a leader who understands that our military should not be committed unless there's a national security threat to this country. We shouldn't be doing it for humanitarian reasons as much as you might want to do that. We only commit our military if our security is at, is at risk, and uh, I can tell you as president, that's what I would do. Wow. Great. Well, I want to take the last couple minutes and talk about some of your accomplishments. And there are many. There are many accomplishments. And first of all, I think the greatest accomplishment is your family. I hope you were going to say that. Is that right? Because we hadn't talked <laughs> about that. Too. Yeah, we my to faith in my faith. family. I, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm very, very blessed. Karen and I have been married 21 years, and uh, we uh, we have uh, our oldest daughter is 20, but then we have an 18-year-old, a 16-year-old, 13-year-old, 11, 10, and three. Wow. wow! So we have we're raising seven children, and uh, they are the greatest blessing of our lives and you know one of the real struggles when you run for president is you know yeah I've got seven <laughs> children time. yeah and, and it's very very difficult mm -hmm. and uh, particularly our youngest we have a very special little girl mm -hmm. she was uh, uh, a great and welcome surprise that little three-year-old but when she was born four days later the doctors came to us and said uh, she was born five weeks premature and they came and said to us that she has a um, a chromosomal disorder, abnormality, called trisomy 18. Hmm. And they said, your daughter is going to die. That it's, uh, she was lucky to be born alive because 90% of children with this disorder die at or before birth. And of the 10% that survive, only 10% uh, live to be a year. Wow. And so we were hit with that. And they told us we were going to send you home on hospice care. And the long story short, uh, she has had some health difficulties, but she is the greatest joy that our family has ever known. And every one of the kids would say that. She is the center of our lives. She is, has very severe disabilities, but one ability she has is that she can love. Yes. And she loves her mom and dad, and we love her, and she is what makes the sun rise in our lives. And we have learned from that the great gift of life that God has Amen. given to all of us. Mm -hmm. And we are all in some way disabled, certainly compared to Him. Right. And we just feel blessed to have her. Yes. Well, I can just tell from the passion and the smile when I mention <laughs> yeah. your family. Uh, that is wonderful. And we can't thank you enough for coming by yes, and being with us. thank you so much. To find out more about Rick Santorum and his campaign for the presidency, please log on to www.ricksantorum.com 
or www.facebook.com forward slash Rick Santorum. On his website, you can find additional contact information along with sign-up instructions for email updates from the campaign. Again, just log on to www.ricksantorum.com for details. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and the new republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're going to continue in this next segment to take a look at issues in this country that concern many of us. Former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee, who is not running for president, recently spoke at a conference sponsored by the American Family Association. We are going to show you an excerpt of that speech taken from the Rediscover God in America program that airs on CTN's Lifestyle Network. Governor Huckabee's remarks include a discussion of America's relationship with Israel. It is exciting. Let's listen in. As David Barton was talking, I realized we really don't know a whole lot about our heritage. I mean, it's pretty scary. Most kids today, they grow up, they go to school, they get just a tiny little bit of American history. We, we all know the horror stories of American history textbooks that have more information about Marilyn Monroe than they do about Abraham Lincoln. Recently, President's Day just happened last month. Kid came home from school. His mother said, tell me what you learned. Well, I learned it was President's Day. Well, what did you learn about President's Day? Well, I think it's something like that the President steps out of the White House on President's Day. And if he sees his shadow, we have two more years of unemployment. <laughs> We really don't understand a whole lot of our history. I enjoy, as much as anybody, trying to inject some humor into any type of meeting I'm a part of. And sometimes it ends up being unintentional. I say something that I didn't think was funny and everybody laughs and I act like it really was a joke all along. But tonight I, I want to take as serious a turn as I can because I do believe that we are in some very serious times as a country. And the reason that we have gathered here tonight is not just so that we could eat a meal, because you could have eaten a meal at home. You could have eaten a meal at any restaurant or diner anywhere in Iowa. You could have gone to a program or a conference. There's something unique about the reason for which we have gathered here. And it is not to eat nor to hear. It is to do. It is to somehow get within us the idea that God has not placed us on this earth to be hearers of the word, but doers. Doers. Sometimes that requires for us to take a stand. And the stand that we take sometimes will be very painful and will exact from us a high price. David Barton was mentioning our trip to Israel. This was for me, this most recent one, the 15th time I have been. I started going when I was not quite 18 years old. I've been going since 1973. Through the years I've seen incredible change in the nation, in uh, the entire Middle East, and I've been all over the Middle East, to Syria, to Lebanon, to Iraq, to Afghanistan. I've been to Jordan, to Egypt. There aren't many parts of that world that I have not been to at some point or another over the past 35 years. And of all the many places that I have been and seen, and, and certainly to go to Israel, I go there largely because I want to walk the steps of Jesus and I want to be where our Lord was. And I am moved every time I'm there. But I'm also there because I realize that there is an extraordinary lesson for us in Israel. This nation, much older than ours, 
is a nation that was given an opportunity for rebirth in 1948. And after 2,000 years of exile, where its people were scattered, dispersed across all the world, through nothing short of a miracle, they were able to begin the return home. And this little nation that I've just seen for less than 40 years in my lifetime, I have watched it from a sleepy little agricultural sliver of land, mostly sand, to become one of the greenest, most fruitful, most amazing places where not only does agriculture reign as the envy of any developed country, but where the highest levels of technology and the advancement of science make it one of the economic engines, not just of the Middle East, but of the entire globe. It is, in fact, a nation that is nothing short of a miracle. I believe that our nation is a nation that is nothing short of a miracle. There is no human explanation for how a group of farmers whose muskets were better suited for rabbit hunting than taking on the British Army could have ever taken on such a task and challenged the greatest, most advanced, well-equipped, well-trained, well-financed army in the world at that time and been able to declare their independence, which in of itself would have been an extraordinary act of arrogance, and then be able to pull it off. When I watched the rebels in Libya attempting to unshackle themselves from the nutcase who was there as their longtime leader, a person with the personality of Charlie Sheen and the wardrobe of Lady Gaga, <laughs> that it is an amazing thing that people in their quest for freedom would literally take as one particular Libyan rebel did a toy plastic gun and go against an army and if you have not seen that video google it one of the rebels literally was out there and all he had was a plastic gun. It was a toy. He knew it wasn't real, but it's all he had. And when I see our nation's history, and I see that of Israel, I see people who would have stormed hell with a plastic toy water pistol if necessary because they believed that they were doing that which was right. And the many times I've been to Israel, and as I tell you, I go there because I want people to see the biblical sites, and we always do that. But there's another place I make sure that we go. I take the people who go with me to the top of Masada. It is not a biblical site. There's nothing biblical that happened there. And sometimes people will say, why are we going there? I, I can't find anything in the Old and the New Testament about Masada. Is it because it's not there? But I want you to go there, and when we stand on top of it, I want you to understand something. Why this is a unique country. And why that our relationship with Israel as Americans is not merely an organizational relationship. It is an organic relationship. Because both of us have come with our founding, having been born out of people who were willing to literally lay down their lives so that the next generation after them could live in freedom, something that they knew they were one breath away from losing. Masada is the fortress, the natural rock fortress near the Dead Sea, deep within the desert. It is a place that Herod had built this incredible place of escape. And it is stunning to think that anything of its magnificence could have been built there, but he built it in case he was ever being chased and he would go and this natural fortress which was almost impregnable because it, it's so difficult to get to it except by the one means up the side of the wall. And those who are atop can fire down upon any attackers and it's just virtually impossible to overcome the garrison on top of Masada. I, I don't have the time tonight to relate to you the whole story, but 
when Jerusalem fell in AD 73, in AD 70, a band of 900 Jews escaped to Masada. And there they took that place, and for the next three years, against 10,000 Romans, they defended themselves. And they were able, because there was food stored there, they ate well. Because there was water stored there, they not only had water to drink, they had water to swim in and to bathe in and had steam baths. As the Roman soldiers melted in the hot desert sun below on the shores of the Dead Sea. And it was a point of great embarrassment to the Romans and great challenge to them. And finally, after three years, the Romans, using Jewish slave labor and literally taking the lives of the Jews on the top, their relatives and their compatriots, their lives, to build a ramp to get to the top and take it. The decision was made that rather than die at the hands of the Romans, that they would die at their own hand. And the night before the Romans were to break through with a battering ram, Eleazar ben Yair gave a speech forever immortalized in the works of Josephus, and I want to just say these words to you. It said, since we long ago resolved never to be servants to the Romans, nor to any other than to God himself, who alone is the true and just Lord of mankind, the time is now come that obliges us to make that resolution true in practice. We were the very first that revolted, and we are the last to fight against them. And I cannot but esteem it as a favor that God has granted us, that it is still in our power to die bravely and in a state of freedom. And so on that night, rather than to allow their wives and their children to be savaged by the Romans, they drew lots from among them, and they carried out the deed of taking their own lives and leaving plenty of food so the Romans would know they did not do this act because they were desperate, but because they had rather die in freedom than live in slavery. To this day, when a young Israeli Defense Force soldier is inducted into the military in Israel. A rite of passage that every male must do and serve three years and every female must do and serve two years. One of the reasons for which they have an extraordinary level of patriotism and nationalism, the likes of which we have lost in this country. But they have one of two places to which they can go for the induction ceremony. One is at the Western Wall near the Temple Mount, but the other is Masada. And when the soldiers go, they stand at Masada at midnight, having gone up the snake path in its back course with a torch light. And at midnight, they make this declaration. Masada will never fall again. And when you see the Israeli soldiers fighting and putting their lives on the line against all of the enemies which surround them. Understand that it is not merely a job and it is not merely something that they feel they must do because of the peer pressure. They do because they understand that their very existence is on the line every single day. And they have made a vow to God and to each other and to their nation that Masada will never fall again. I pray that God will raise up spiritual warriors who will say, America will not fall. That we will not let this nation fall to the hands of those who would enslave us. But great conflicts in life require great decisions. Conflict is inevitable. But the conflict that we face in this nation is not the conflict between Democrat and Republican, though many people reduce it to something as insignificant as that. Let me assure you that the conflict we face is far bigger than some political party. You may be of one, I may be of one different than you. Good chance that many of us are of the same one, but it doesn't matter. None of us should give so great a price as our lives to die 
for the mere partisan politics of any political party. This battle is not Democrat versus Republican. This battle is not Tea Party versus Pelosi. This battle we face is not one about elites and the common. This battle is one that pits good against evil. There are things that are right, and there are things that are wrong. And the great battle that we will live or die by to preserve this nation is one in which we identify and then we fight for to the last breath that there are some things that are holy and pure and that are just. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we remember the magnificent story of Elijah. And as the classic praise saying tonight, these are the days of Elijah, I could not help but think, these are the days of Elijah. But do we know what that means? We sing that song, but do we have any clue what it means to say these are the days of Elijah? Well, if we go to 1 Kings chapter 18, let me tell you what it means. For Elijah, it meant that he was willing to stand against 450 prophets of Baal. And he was willing to say, you call on your God, I'll call on mine. Let's see which one's real. I put it all on the line. Those aren't good odds, folks, 450 to 1. And just to make it so that it would be sporting, he decided that both the prophets of Baal, all 450 of them, and he, the lone prophet of God, would both prepare altars. And they would prepare their sacrifice, and they would cut up the bullock, and they would get it all ready so that it would be prepared for the offering. And then he, he declared, let us call upon our gods. I will call upon the Lord God. You call upon any and all of the gods you have. And let's see which God answers. Elijah then ordered that water would be poured all over and around and underneath the altar so that it would be even more difficult for that altar to ignite. The prophets of Baal went first and they screamed and they yelled and they cut themselves and they went through every kind of religious ritual they could. They danced, they sang, and nothing happened and Elijah taunted them. Folks, if you taunt 450 people and you're just one, you better hope things turn out okay. <laughs> and he made fun of them and laughed at them. And when it was complete that they were not going to be able to get their God to do anything, he stood back on the top of Mount Carmel and he called for God, the true God, to show himself. And as Forrest Gump so brilliantly said, God showed up. <laughs> and the fire fell, and it not only consumed the sacrifice, but it lapped up all the water and all the altar around it. And on that day, there was no doubt who the God of Elijah was. These are the days of Elijah. These are the days in which we must no longer falter. Elijah said, how long will you falter between two opinions? How long will you hesitate? And I wonder sometimes, and I, I, I want to just say to people in this country, how long will we falter? I like that word, falter. It's not one you hear very often. I doubt you see someone saying, hey, have you been faltering lately? <laughs> you can see it, though. Bothers me when people falter. I go to a McDonald's and there's someone in front of me and they're looking at the menu and they're going, uh, I think, um, I may, uh, dude, it's a McDonald's. It's the same stinking thing here. It is everywhere else. Make a decision. This is not hard. This ain't Cheesecake Factory people. They got one page. It's real simple. If you can't decide, let me pick for you. We got people who can't even decide what to get at McDonald's for heaven's sakes. But we got something more important than that. We've got to decide that we are going to live our lives as unto God 
and truly say these are the days of Elijah and not falter. There's the face-off. I mentioned how that those prophets did their best against Elijah, but they could not. But then the fire falls, and it's pretty evident what is right and what is not. I sometimes get very unhappy when I hear people, they'll get on television or radio, or maybe they'll write articles and they'll blog and they'll talk about how America is in its last days. And we are not going to survive these crises that we face. And that may be true, I don't know. But here's what I do know. That it is not up for me to make that determination. It is not up for me to decide that this is the last generation, that we have nothing to give to our kids and to our grandkids. If God is the one who by his providence gave us this land and gave birth to this amazing country where David Barton so beautifully and eloquently reminded us has existed under one constitution longer than any government in the history of mankind, then let me assure you that the same God who gave us birth is the only God who can pull the plug on us. This country isn't finished until he is finished with us. And until then, it is our job to be faithful to the task for which he has placed us here. And when the fire falls, and the fire doesn't fall because of our human might. It falls because God answers the prayers of his people. And when the fire falls, faith flourishes. And I ask you tonight, if you believe that the next election is how America will be saved, even though I care a great deal about elections, very likely the next one, I still want you to understand fully that the greatness of this nation and the hope and the future of this nation is not dependent upon who we elect in a human position as much as it is that the pastors of this nation on their faces before God, then on their feet before their people, bring fire to their pulpits and bring revival to this great land and remind us whose people we are. And we say, we will never fall again. Wow. Wasn't that something? Oh, my goodness. So true. You know, these issues are near and dear to the very heart of God. Yes. This nation has got to turn back to God, honey. Amen. And all these things Governor Huckabee talked about, we need to take to heart. Amen. And uh, let's end this program with prayer. And we want to pray for you. We want to pray for our nation. And we want to pray for you, too. Yes. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in this country. We don't know who's going to be president. We don't know any of this. But the important thing is that we turn to God, that we give our lives over to God. Now, Father, I pray for everyone that's watching right now we ask lord that you would speak to their heart yes father you would move upon each and every one draw them close to yourself let this be the day of salvation for many watching this program we thank you father and lord we just pray that if you pray with us right now, you will know the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. And there's many of you that don't know him. But Governor Huckabee was talking about that. Would you just say this with me? Dear Lord Jesus. Dear Lord Jesus. Come into my heart. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Come into my life. Make me over anew. Make me over anew. I want to be your child. I want to be your child. I want to be born again. I want to be born again. And we pray in the name of Jesus that you will be born again. Amen. If you said that in all sincerity, then God will come into your life. 
He'll come into your heart. That's right, honey. And make you over anew. And that's what's important. You know, it's more important than the next president. It really is. You, because we're talking about eternal things that's right. for you. And we want you eternally saved by his mighty power. Amen. We thank you for listening today. It's been a great program. I'll never wow. forget <laughs> part of this when he was talking about Masada and things like that. That's what really impacts me. The God of Israel is our God also. Amen. God bless you. See you on the God next bless Good Life. Our marriage was absolutely a mess. I've grown to hate this man. We were abusive to each other verbally and physically. We fought all the time. But then I found a relationship with God, and my heart began to change. We were through with each other, but thankfully, God wasn't through with us. No relationship is too broken. See our whole story online at nothingstoohardforgod.org.